Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it? I'm having trouble knowing where to start. I already did some of them. Okay. But it didn't look good. So, and then my laptop crashed. I'm running out of, I guess, one drive. Okay, okay. Right? yeah, that's, uh, that's a look. So, let's we'll start a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, what type of model is this? Here? It's the Aorta. Aorta, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, the Aorta is, uh, yeah, you should be able to find it uh, not too bad here. So I think what's different about this aorta one compared to the tutorial is that you actually see the arch. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think so. Normally, when um, when I start these, I actually start near the heart, and so I try to find where the aorta kind of leaves the heart. Okay. But actually, I think you know, after talking with people last year, people actually find it more easy to start near the clock. Because what's, oh, what really? the aorta is going to do is going to go up like this. Right. It's going to arch it down because it has okay. to go it has to go towards the lower body. So they go. They start. Doing that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so, because it's a bit easier to find where it starts here, and then okay. you kind of you end up in the heart. And so basically, you keep going until you, you can't really make up the muscle. Okay. And so let's let's start here. So let's find the up. So let's uh, kind of scroll up and down here. And so eventually, you should get to a point. Oh, you see the kidneys are running up there. <laughs> now let's go back the other way. Okay. So basically, what I'm looking for is uh, basically where the arch kind of comes. In. There it is. Okay. Okay. Cool. So do you see this? Uh, this kind of I, yours shows that actually pretty bright. It's actually pretty good. Okay. So, uh, let's go ahead. So it looks like it's this one right here. Okay. Right? Yeah. That's the, okay. Yeah. So let's go ahead. Uh, you know how to zoom, right? So right. hold right click. Yeah. And go ahead and click. Solid works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that looks good. So okay. I use it. I, I use the use the cursor to kind of orient yourself. So if you okay. click here. You can see that it's kind of in the middle of that vessel. Okay. That's good. Uh, and so this makes sense. So this, this is the axial view. And so you're viewing this one basically up and down. This, these are like slices that are going this one. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so that makes sense. And so it looks like we can go down a bit more. So let's let's go to this, click on this one right here. Uh -huh. And let's scroll down. Keep scrolling down until, it, and uh, kind of keep an eye on that vessel. And let's keep going that until we can't see it. You should be able to go almost to the bottom. Oh, wow, it does go really, really. Yeah, it's go pretty far. Yeah. 
So here I think is a good spot right here. Okay. So I think you can probably start right here. Okay. And so start, go ahead and start your path. And then instead of going down, I know the tutorial went down, right. but this time you're going to go, up. go up. Yeah, so you're going to go up and then eventually you're going to keep following the path. It's going to go this way. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to arch, okay. arch going back down. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think once you get that starting point, so I would recommend do the, do the path for this one first. Okay. Uh, and make, make sure you save throughout because it okay. tends to crash quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, once you have that path, go ahead and do the segmentation. Then you should have a good outline of that vessel as it goes along. Okay. And then everything else is going to branch off the other. Okay. So yeah. I was like, starting not down. I was starting more like right here. And I was doing uh, this stuff. But yeah. Okay. That's that's the way it's Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 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 So, yeah. Start down there. And then once you get that, that the rest should, should come. All right. I appreciate it. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 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 Are we still shooting for the midterm like two weeks? Um, yes. Okay. Yes, we are. So this this what we're covering this week will probably be the last content that's gonna be on the midterm. Okay. And then after that, it's more just kind of extra information and more focusing on the project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the model I'm trying to do, um, the vessel kind of it goes and goes, and then at the end, I think it goes to the heart. Yeah. And then the whole heart basically light up in the image. So where do you exactly stop? Stop when stop when it stops looking like a, a, a circle. Okay, and so once it goes to the heart, you can't really follow it anymore. Just whatever you guys don't have a circle anymore. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the exact one, but you know, but just try to get as close to the heart as uh -huh. you can. And once you kind of lose it, then you can just stop yeah, that. Kind of, it's multiple things light up, and then like the organs also light up. It does, they like do. <laughs> yeah, the bone, the bones light up too, and yeah. so yeah, it's it's hard, and I think a lot of people are, are figuring that out yeah. <laughs> this past weekend. Yeah. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. All right, it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. Get in there. Week twelve. We're uh, we're, we're approaching the final final uh, semesters, final final uh, weeks of the semester. Uh, it's funny. On Saturday we had the uh, uh, I don't I, I still don't even know what they call it. But we, it's basically the new welcome day for incoming freshmen. Uh, and the, and I ran to the dean and she asked me, "It's like, oh, are you prepared to uh, finish the semester?" And I said, "Well, I'll try my best. I think we're getting there." She said, "How many weeks are left?" I said, "Well, next week is week twelve. And she's like, "Well, so there's three weeks left." I'm like, no, there's five weeks, <laughs> but I'm not going to correct the deed, especially when she's so uh, just so adamant on that. But, you know, so we have five weeks left. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, we still got time for the projects and everything. So, you know, but uh, so we have a little bit over a month. To do. OK, uh, so the plan for today is we're going to cover a new set of lecture notes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this this set of lecture notes is, is a little bit math heavy as well. Um, but the techniques that we do for this one kind of very closely follow what we did for impedance. And so, you know, these two just kind of go together just in terms of, you know, how we solve the equations. Uh, but I promise this is the last week that we do some really intense math stuff. And so uh, someone asked me before the class if we're still on schedule to do the midterm exam in two weeks. And uh, we still are. 
And this is going to be the last week of content that's going to be on the on the midterm. Okay. Uh, and so after this, you know, uh, we're going to cover more biological stuff. We're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about CFD quite a bit. Uh, and so that's the plan for next week. So next week we're going to learn about CFD, and then um, yeah, and then you'll just be working on your projects at, until the end of the semester. Yeah. Are we going to have one, one more homework before the midterm? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It'll be a really short one though. So it'll be. I mean, so the thing with the last few lectures, you know, they've been really math heavy. And I'm not going to ask you to do any of that math on the exam, but I do want you to understand the conceptual stuff that goes along with those. And so it'll probably just be maybe like six or seven conceptual questions, um, you know, for the homework, and then you'll turn that in. Yeah, so that'll there'll be one more homework based on that. And the midterm exam will be a lot of conceptual stuff as well. So the only problem solving stuff that I would probably ask you to do is probably, you know, if you go think back, I keep referring back to it, but, you know, it was really important. The uh, introduction to fluids lecture notes and so you know there's gonna be some elementary fluid stuff um and also the lump parameter model so those will be the main problem solving parts of the midterm everything else will be mostly conceptual conceptual stuff okay all right and so uh of course the other big thing that's due this week is your midterm projects are due this friday uh so i've already talked you know i've, I've already seen quite a few you guys, uh, quite a few of, you guys, of your guys's projects and a lot of you are making great progress um but you know i think the thing that i see the most is that you know the hardest thing for these projects is, is just getting started. And so I think what a lot of people are noticing is that the image data for your projects is not as clean as the, as the tutorial project. You know, it's a little bit hard to kind of interpret what's going on and, and trying to figure out where to get started. And so um, you know, that's that's normal. And so you know, it's 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 you know, normally, you know, these are these are medical images. And so, you know, people go to school for years to 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 to, to, uh, to try to interpret what's going on in these. And so you know, please reach out. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to help you out just to help you get started. Um, I've already, I think I've already talked to, you know, quite a few people in the class, but, you know, if you're still kind of struggling, you know, where to look in the image data, what kind of stands out, you know, how to get the model, how to get, you know, the model close to the, to the images, you know, please let me know. Um, I don't have office hours tomorrow. Uh, and in fact, I, I actually won't even be on campus tomorrow because I have a doctor's appointment. Um, you know, but if you want to meet, if you want to make an appointment, uh, I'm more than happy to meet over Zoom. Uh, and in fact, I think that's probably the one of the best things we can do so that, you know, I can kind of guide you through the software just to kind of show you, you know, this is the vessel you should be looking for. Um, you know, start your path here and then follow it along that, that path. And I think that's the best thing to do. So, and so if you're still, if you're still kind of struggling with the project, you know, please reach out, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to make time for you this week before it's due on, on Friday. Okay. All right, and so that's it for my announcements. Um, and so are there any questions I can answer before we get started? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and start today. Right. And so the topic for this week is uh, called oscillating flow in a rigid vessel. Okay. And so, you know, for the past couple of weeks, you know, we've, we've been discussing the, um, the 1D equations, right? And the idea with the 1D equations is to get a better handle or to get some expressions to help us um, define the, the wave propagation phenomena. Okay. And so this week, you know, we're going to go over a different set of equations, but we're going to focus on a different aspect of the okay? One that we've kind of neglected for, for quite a while. Uh, and that aspect is the velocity profile. Okay. And by velocity profile, what I mean is, you know, what does the velocity field look like in, in a blood vessel, right? We've, we've already done, we've already done this and for the kind of the simplest of case, right? And so if we, if we have a rigid vessel and if we assume that the flow is steady, right? We saw that the velocity profile looks like this. Right. And of course, this was back from our review of fluids, right? So this was our Hagen Poisson flow. Now, 
And I always have to look up how to spell his name. And so if you remember, you know, the way that we saw, the way that we obtained this result was we took the Navier-Stokes equations and cylindrical coordinates, and we made a bunch of assumptions. We canceled a bunch of terms, and we solved that differential equation, and we got this, uh, this result right here, okay? The main upside for this is that Poisson flow is characterized by its shape, right? And so what, oftentimes what we call this is uh, parabolic flow. Part of the reason we call it parabolic flow is because no one remembers how to spell Poisson's name, but the other reason is because of its shape, right? And so the function that we got was that u, uz of r, okay? It was some function that was about, you know, it was proportional to r squared, right? Of course, there was a bunch of other stuff. It involved the pressure gradient, involved the viscosity and the radii and all that stuff, but essentially it was a function, it was a quadratic function. So we say that the flow is parabolic. Okay. All right. And so what's different here? And so, you know, if we've already solved for this, you know, what, what more is there to do? Okay. Well, there's actually quite a bit. And so, you know, there's, you know, in order to obtain this result, we had to make these two key assumptions here, right? And so first of all, we had to assume that the walls were rigid, right? That the walls weren't moving at all. And we had to assume that the flow was steady, okay? We know at this point that, you know, both of those assumptions are not necessarily true for, for blood flow, okay? Okay. Right. So first of all, we know that blood vessels there are they're elastic, elastic tubes, right? And so they're deformable. Uh, and we also know the flow is not steady because the flow is is oscillating, it's pulse time due to the actions of the heart. Okay. Uh, and so you know, in order to get a truly accurate solution for the velocity profile, we're going to have to relax both of these assumptions uh, eventually. Okay. But relaxing both at the same time is is kind of um, you know it's it's a little bit too much to tackle in one week. And so. This week we're going to tackle what I think is is that is the most is the more important one, which is the uh, which is the steady assumption. Okay. And so this week, this week we're going to see what happens to the velocity profile when we assume that our flow is unsteady. But doing just kind of general unsteady flow is, is, is a little bit too difficult. And so we're gonna make one kind of key restriction here. Um, and, it, and it's physically motivated. Okay? And so instead of just uh, pure unsteady flow, we're gonna look at a very special case of unsteady flow where the pressure gradient um, that, you, that, that the flow experiences oscillates like a sine wave. And so we're basically going to assume that the pressure gradient is some kind of you know, sine or cosine function. Right? And that's going to help us out quite a bit because that's going to help us simplify our analogy. And what you'll see is that you know, when, we, when we go and we actually start working on the equations, the exact same techniques that we use for uh, impedance, right, where we assume that the solution is separable and we plug in the solution and you know, we worked out the terms, we're going to use that exact same technique here. It's just under a different, uh, under a different um, set of conditions.
All right, so that's kind of the motivation of you know where we're going to go this week and why we're going to pursue, um, you know, this uh, this part. Any questions on on this so far? Just trying to like, is there a reason why I guess people would want to take the lot two twelve prior twelve O as opposed to just the velocity? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And so the and so you know one thing that the velocity profile gives us is that it allows us to compute shear stress accurately. Remember, you know, whenever you have any kind of fluid that's flowing past the surface, you know, it's going to impart some kind of shear stress because that's basically the friction in the, in the fluid, right? Uh, so far, you know, we, we haven't been able to really do this. And so if you think of the lump parameter models, you think of the 1D equations, you think of the impedance, there was no way for us to really compute shear stress because we weren't solving for velocity, we were solving for flow rate. And so, you know, the big, the big advantage that you get for computing velocities is that it allows us to compute the shear stress. And so one, you know, the shear stress form is actually quite complicated for, for three-dimensional flow, but for just one-dimensional flow like this, we can say that the shear stress is equal to the viscosity multiplied by the derivative of the velocity with respect to R, okay? And so the shear stress depends very strongly on that velocity derivative, okay? And so without computing the velocity profile, there's no way for you to compute that derivative, okay? And so this will be kind of the first time in this class where, where you know, we'll be able to compute that shear stress, you know, which we know is, is, is very important for, for blood flow, because that's what's going to trigger you know, a lot of the endothelial cells. That's, gonna, that's what's going to trigger a lot of the biological processes. Uh, it, it triggers you know, platelet, uh, platelet, platelet, platelet aggregation and platelet activation. And so you know, this will be the first time that we can, we can really compute this in this, in this case. And actually, you know, if you kind of look at the progression of kind of where we've been in this class and, you know, how we've progressed, the models that we've been looking at have kind of been increasing in complexity. And so we started, you know, with, you know, I would say kind of the start, the start of, of the new stuff in this class was lump parameter models. And so you, and a lot of people think of one of lump parameter models as kind of like zero D models because there's no spatial, there's no really sense of any spatial, uh, um, you know, spatial dependence on that. Then we went from the zero D lump parameter models to the one D equations. Okay? And so that was a big step up in complexity. And then these, uh, and then this, um, this week right here, you know, we're looking at these velocity profiles, you know, which are kind of like 2D, 2D structures, right? And so we're kind of progressing up in complexity. And so we went, we start from the simplest and we're getting up to the most complex. And then we'll, and the next week when we cover CFD, CFD will be the most complex because that'll be a 3D, a 3D flow uh, visualization. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so the more dimensions that you add, um, it's, it's getting more complex, but it's, it's getting a lot more accurate as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. All right. Let's see where are we. Okay. And so in addition to this assumption right here, we're going to have to make a few more, right? Because we're going to be working directly off the Navier-Stokes. Uh, but as we know, Navier-Stokes by itself is, is, is way too complex for us to solve. And so we're going to make some additional assumptions. Okay, so first thing we're going to assume is that the flow is uh, fully developed. Okay. And so what that basically means is that uh, the velocity is not changing in the in the z direction or in the um, in the center line direction.
And so the upshot of this is that anytime we see a derivative with respect to z, we're going to set it equal to zero. Okay. The next assumption that we're going to make is that the flow is axisymmetric. Okay. And so what this means is that any derivatives with respect to theta is going to be zero. Okay. And so since we still have a cylindrical blood vessel, we're still going to be working under uh, cylindrical coordinates. And so you know, we're going to have theta that's there, but we're going to neglect any changes there. Right? Uh, and we're still going to assume um, rigid walls. And the upshot of this is that you know we're going to have a no-slip boundary condition at the vessel at the vessel radius. Okay. Okay. And so basically, you know, we're 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 kind of solving the same problem that we did back, you know, way back when, when we did a review of fluids, except the only, the only assumption that we're lifting is that of steady flow. Okay. So we're going to keep, we're going to keep the time derivative here. All right. And so under these assumptions, And so under these assumptions, you know, we're, we're going to be working with the Navier-Stokes. And so the Navier-Stokes equations in the Z direction The Navier-Stokes equations in the z direction, it reduces to the following. And so we're going to have, we're going to have our time derivative. And so that's our big addition here. Okay. Okay. Then we have partial p partial z plus new partial squared uz partial r squared plus one over r partial uz partial r. Okay. And so at first glance, you know, maybe it doesn't look that uh, that intimidating, but uh, um, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still a PDE, right? And so we still have a partial differential equation. And so that's going to be, um, that's going to be an, an issue. All right, and so before we solve this, you know, let's uh, let's let's make um, not not an assumption, but let's let's kind of make a distinction of, you know, what I mean by oscillating flow. Okay, and so even though you know we're going to have oscillating flow, you know, we know that there's you know even though the the heart is pumping and it's causing changes with time, we know that there's a net flow forward of blood in the cardiovascular system. And so what do I mean by that? And so, you know, if we were to graph the flow as a function of time, okay? And let's say that we're measuring this flow, you know, somewhere, you know, not, not close to the heart, but somewhere, you know, downstream. So maybe this might be in your arm or your leg, right? The flow might look something like this. And so, you know, of course there's gonna be changes with time, right? But, you know, in addition to the oscillating part, we have kind of this average part or this mean part, okay? And so this mean part right here 
This mean part here is meant to represent that in the net or in the in the mean, you know, we have we're, we're still pushing flow forward, in the, and so you know the oscillations are going to go around that mean. And so even though we have changes that go up and down, you know, there's still there's still a mean flow forward. Right? And so what this means is that we can take this we can take this kind of generic waveform and we can decompose it. Right? And so we can decompose it into two parts that we can consider just added together, right? And so in the in the first part, we have a mean steady uh, steady component, okay? And so this looks like just this, right? Right. And so we have one part that kind of uh, that kind of specifies the average the average behavior or the average flow forward, right? And then on the other hand, we have the oscillating part. Right. And so the oscillating part would look something like this. And what's important about this is that the oscillating part, you know, this this looks exactly like just a pure sine and cosine. Right? In this case, it's a pure sine. Right? On the other hand, the mean the mean and steady part, you know, we can we can consider that we've we've already solved this part, right? And so the mean part, which is not changing with time, you know, we've We've kind of already solved this problem. So this is our steady flow in a rigid vessel. Right, and so we're not going to focus on the left on the left problem because we've we've already done it, right. And so we're going to focus just purely on the right. And what we can say is that if we if we can solve for the velocity profile um, for a situation that's purely oscillatory, right, and so it has zero mean, but it just kind of goes back and forth around that mean, all we have to do is just add it together to the solution that we already have to get the complete velocity profile. Okay, and so we're going to add these together. We're going to add these together to get the full solution. Okay. Right. And so if we've already solved the left, that means the only thing we have to solve for is the is the right right here. Okay. Okay. Yep. 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 So uh, for any for any complex wave, you can. I mean, just in general, you know, if, if you kind of remember, uh, if you guys weren't if you guys have learned Fourier series before, um, then what Fourier series says is that you can you can take any function any function in the world and decompose it as a sum of sine and cosines. Uh, and so what you'll see a lot, and you'll and if you if you take more advanced math, you know, you'll you'll see this theme come up quite a bit. Um, if you can get your solution in terms of sines and cosines. Uh, you're you're in fantastic shape because under Fourier's law, you know you can take that sine and cosine solution and apply it to almost almost anything. And so, sines and cosines pop up a lot. And and here it kind of, I would say it kind of shows up in kind of a pure way because we're actually modeling oscillation with it. Um, but you know it's it's a very common thing. So you'll see a lot of mathematical techniques um, kind of built around sines and cosines just because it's it's you know you can use it to construct any any function. Um, and because, you know, um, you know, the solutions are linear, that means we can just add them together. And so, you know, that's kind of a, a really nice, 
a really nice property. And so, you know, we're, we're going to get into the derivation, you know, right after this, but, you know, we're basically going to make the assumptions that our solutions also look like sine and cosine, essentially. Okay, uh, any other questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so let's jump, let's jump into the derivation. Then. Okay. And so since we're going to assume our, our solutions are purely oscillatory, um, let's assume that our pressure gradient first is um, a sine and cosine function. All right, now I understand why they needed this. So if you're in Zoom, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I tried, I, I was worried that people were talking to the mic earlier, so I turned up the volume, uh, but it's making sounds again. And so if you have questions on Zoom, uh, you know, please put in the chat, uh, then I can, tr I can crank up the volume after that. Okay. And so what we're going to assume is that, you know, in our Navier-Stokes equations, we had this partial P partial Z. What we're going to assume is that this is going to be equal to some function or some constant A multiplied by E to the I omega T, right? right? And so we just saw E to the I omega T. And so we know because of Euler's formula, This e to the i omega t is kind of the um, the calling card, or kind of the uh, the representation for any generic sinusoid function. Okay, so this a cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. Okay. Uh, but e to the i omega t is a little bit easier to work with, especially because we're going to be taking derivatives, and so we're going to use that e to the i omega t. Okay, and so similarly, okay. similarly, we're also going to assume that our velocity solution is um, is a sinusoid with the same frequency. Uh, in addition, you know, our velocity is going to depend not only on time, but our velocity is going to depend on the radius as well, right? Because it's a velocity profile. Okay. And so in other words, you know, our velocity here is a function of two variables, right? And so it's a function of the radius and it's a function of time. And so just like we did with the impedance unit, you know, when we have a solution here that depends on multiple things, we're going to assume that our solution is separable, okay? And if you recall, what separable means is that the two contributions or the contributions from the radius and the contribution from the time, they're gonna exist as two separate functions. So we're gonna have one function here, that's just purely a function of the radius, right? So it's e to u to the um, u is a function of r. Okay. And then we're going to multiply that by a function of time. And so in this case, the function of time that we're going to be uh, multiplying by is a purely oscillatory one. And so we have u of r times e to the i of omega t. Right? And that's and that's what we're going to assume.
All right, so now that we have an assumed form for the, for the velocity and we have, uh, we have an assumed form for the pressure gradient, we're set to go ahead and plug these into Navier-Stokes, okay? And so our Navier-Stokes equations, you know, is up here, okay? And so I'm gonna do everywhere I see U, I'm gonna plug in our assumed solution, our separable solution. And for the place that I see the pressure gradient, I'm gonna plug in for that as well, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and plug it in. And so first we have partial U partial T. And so if we take the derivative of this, of this function here with respect to time, the I omega is gonna come out in front. And so we have I omega U of R E to the I omega T. Then we have the pressure gradient term. And so we're just gonna go ahead and plug straight into that. Okay, and so we have an A over the density, A over rho multiplied by E to the I omega T. Okay. And then we have all of our viscous terms. And so the viscous terms, they involve our viscosity. Okay. Then we have a second order derivative with respect to R. And so that's going to be d squared u dr squared okay, times e to the i omega t. Then we have a one over r uh, du dr e to the i omega t. Okay. And so here, you know, we kind of take advantage of our, of our forms here. So every, since every term here has e to the i omega t, I'm going to go ahead and cancel all of those out. All right, from here, I'm going to divide the entire equation by the viscosity. And so if we divide the entire equation by viscosity, we have I omega divided by viscosity times U of R is equal to A divided by the density multiplied by the viscosity, okay? Plus D squared U dr squared plus one over R du dr, okay? Next thing I'm gonna do is that here we have the density multiplied by the kinematic viscosity. And so we know that this quantity here is the, turns into the dynamic viscosity, okay? okay. And then another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this entire equation and multiply it by R squared. which might seem a little strange right now, but uh, it's to kind of help, help a bit uh, later on. Okay. And so if we do that, we get I omega R squared divided by nu U of R is equal to A R squared divided by mu plus R squared D squared U D R squared plus R du dr, okay? From here, I'm gonna do a little bit of rearranging. And so I'm gonna take the uh, this term and move it over to the other side of the equation. And then this term, and I move it over to this side, okay? And so if we do that, we get a minus 
a r squared divided by mu is equal to r squared b squared u d r squared plus r r d u d r okay minus i omega r squared divided by nu And so, you know, I think the last few steps, you know, probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And so let me, let me just kind of give you some context. Uh, and this kind of gives you some context of how, you know, more advanced math classes work. And it's, it's, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a trick almost. And so, you know, I, I remember when I first took a, a class in PDEs, um, the, the first thing the instructor told me was that, you know, we're not actually going to learn any math here. We're just going to learn a lot of cool tricks to get you to think that you're doing math. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of how these PDEs are solved. Uh, and so where we're going with this is that, you know, the, I think the last two steps where we multiply by R squared and we do this rearranging, you know, it's, it's, it's strange, you know, it doesn't really make any sense. And so kind of where we're going, and so this is kind of a, an aside, so I'll put this in parentheses, okay. Uh, very similar to what we did with impedance, right? If you kind of remember how we did our derivation impedance, we kind of manipulated the formula until we got the wave equation, right? And then once we got the wave equation, we said, I know how to solve the wave equation because some dude 100 years ago solved it, right? Um, and so we're going to do the same thing here. And so, you know, all the things that we're doing is we're kind of manipulating this equation in order to get it into a standard form, okay? Right? And the nice thing about getting an equation to standard form is that, you know, some dudes 100, 200 years ago have already solved those equations. So if we can get, if we can get, if we can get our equation to match one of those standard forms, we can say that, hey, you know, someone, you know, hundreds of years ago solved this. And so we can just use that. We can just use that solution. Okay. And for this particular problem, um, you know, where we're going is we're, we're going to be emulating a equation by some guy named Bessel. Okay. And unless you're a math nerd, you probably have no idea what Bessel, who Bessel is or what it is, but, uh, you know, he has an equation and it's, and he solved it a long time ago. And so, you know, um, when someone set out to solve this, this problem, they said, you know, I, I bet I can get this into Bessel's form or Bessel's equation. Um, and then we can just use Bessel's formulas to, to solve. It. And so that's kind of where we're, where we're going. And so, you know, the thing, the thing is with a lot of these derivations, like it seems like we're doing a lot of random math steps, just kind of over and over again. Um, you know, but they do have a purpose, and, you know, and I, and I wanted to give you this purpose. Um, so I think with the with you know, like I've said before, with a lot of these kind of long drawn out proofs that take you know quite a while, it's very easy to kind of get lost, and you know, it kind of seems like we're just doing random stuff just for the heck of it. Um, and so it's always good to know what your destination is before you set out to before you set out to do it. Okay, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So let me let me give you the you know let me give you um, the thought process of you know how someone thought this to be a Bessel equation, right? And so first of all, we have a second order ODE, right? So we have two you know we have a second order derivative, a first order derivative, and the function itself. Okay. Uh, and the other thing that we see is we see this pattern, right? And so we have r squared r r squared where R is the primary variable that we're integrating against, okay? 
that's kind of the that's kind of the 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 um, the hallmark or the uh, the characterizing characteristic of the vessels of the vessel form, right? Uh, we're not quite there yet, and so we're not quite at a point where we can just you know plug in the vessel solution, you know. But this is but that's kind of what gave people the idea of you know we could solve this using vessels form, right? Uh, but we need to massage this a little bit more before we can actually do that. Right? Okay. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a change of variables. I don't know why my math, my iPad's doing this today. It's weird. Okay, and so the change of variables that we're going to do is we're going to define a new variable x, okay? And what we're going to say is x squared is going to be equal to minus i r squared omega over nu, okay? Right, so basically, you know, the idea is that this, all of these guys right here, this i omega over nu, they're kind of a, uh, um, you know, unsightly, unsightly blemish, and so we want to change the variables to kind of hide that under the rug. Okay. Okay, and so with this change of variables, you can see that this entire term right here becomes x squared, okay, which is good because that gives us that gets us a lot closer to Bessel's formula. And so if we take the square root of this change of variables here. If we take the square root, we get x is equal to i to the three halves r square root of omega over nu. Okay. Okay, so that's great, and so that that fixes our last term. Okay. But now we have a problem, and so you know if we make this change of variables to x, right? That means we have to change everywhere that we see r. Everywhere that we see R, we're going, to, we're going to need to plug in for X, okay? Okay. Right, which doesn't seem that bad. Oh, question? Ah. Because this, because uh, we have this negative i right here, and so negative i. Another way we can express negative i is i cubed, because uh, i squared is negative one. So, yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good, good, good question. I kind of, uh, kind of um, slipped over that. Yeah. All right. So we need to replace all the r's with x, uh, and that includes all the derivatives. And so instead of du dr, right? So we have du dr up there. We're going to need to convert this to du dx. Okay. And same thing, we're d squared u dr squared. Okay? But to do this, you know, we're we're basically changing the uh, the differentiation variable. And so to do this, you know, we're going to need to do do a uh, some chain rule. Okay, and so let's take each of these terms individually. So we have two of them here, and let's see how they can get converted to um, to x. Okay. All right. So first we have r du dr, right? So that's the first number to convert. Okay, and under the chain rule, we can say this is equal to r partial squared u partial x, which is what we want, multiplied by partial x partial r. So this was so this was done just by just by the chain. Okay, and so here we plug in 
we get um, R du dx, okay? And then we have this quantity, uh, partial x partial r, right? So we can say this is equal to d dr of x, right? But we have a function for x, and that function of x is given by this circle of expression up here. And so we're going to take the r derivative of this, okay? And so i to the 3 halves times r, square root of omega over nu, okay? All right, and so we have an r out here, du dx, okay? We take the derivative of this expression in the parentheses with respect to r, and so that's just gonna cancel out this r right here. And so we have i to the 3 halves times square root of omega over nu. Okay. If I move this r over into this expression right here, and so this is equal to du dx times i to three halves times r square root of omega over nu. Okay. This entire quantity right here, you know, we've, we've seen it before, right? Because it's, it's exactly X, right? Okay. And so let's go ahead and plug in for that. And so this is gonna be equal to X du dx. Okay. And so if we, you know, we started with R du dr. And so what we can say is that R du dr is equal to x du dx, okay? And so under our change of variables, then, um, you know, those two, those two end up matching up exactly, okay? Which is good because that, that r du dr was already kind of in Bessel's form. Uh, and so we kind of just kept that up, we kept that up here, okay? Okay. Any questions on how we did that, uh, how we did that part there? Okay. All right, so that's the first one. The other one that we have to convert here is r squared, d squared u, dr squared. Right, so we have to convert that one as well. And so we're gonna convert this with chain rule as well. And so this is gonna be r squared, d squared u, dx squared times dx dr times dx dr, okay? okay. And so the step I did between those two is I just did chain rule for the uh, for the derivative, okay? Because we want to get our derivative with respect to x instead of instead of r. And so just like we did up here, we can go ahead and plug in for dx dr, okay? And so this is equal to, let me start a new line right here, r squared, d squared u, dx squared. We know dx dr, so dx dr is i to three halves, i to three halves, square root of omega over nu, and since there's two of them, I'm just gonna square this, okay? And so we have r squared, d squared u, dx squared. And so if we square this, this ends up being i cubed square root of omega over nu. or excuse me, um, i cubed times uh, just omega over nu, no square root. Okay. And so from here, we can take the r squared, we can take the r squared and pop it into this uh, expression over here. And so we get d squared u, 
bx squared multiplied by i cubed r squared omega over nu. Okay. We know by just by the definition of our change of variables that this i cubed r squared, this is equal to x squared. Okay. And so all this is equal to x squared, d squared u, dx squared. And so we get r squared, d squared u, dr squared is simply equal to x squared, d squared u, dx squared. Okay. And so not the most exciting result, but you know it's it's you know it's kind of brought about by our clever our clever change of variables. All right, so now that we got expressions for all the R terms in our equation, we can go ahead and plug back into them. And we're going to have a new differential equation that's res with respect to with respect to X as opposed to as opposed to R. Okay. Uh, any questions of what we did, uh, what we did here? Um, yeah, so first step, you did, you did change it. Uh, is there any reason why you did that square, like the uh, dx squared. Oh, but I uh, the, the last one. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. And so uh, the reason we did this is that you know we we kind of applied chain rule twice. And so you know when we apply chain rule twice, you would basically get first thing you would get is is up here, right? And so we'd get the first step of the chain rule would be like r squared d squared u d r squared and so the first step of the chain rule would be r squared ipad's cursed today d squared u uh, and so we're going to convert the first r and so this would be dx dr and so we have a mixed derivative and so we have dx dr here okay and then we're going to convert it through one more chain rule and so that's going to transform this dr into a dx. And so we have an r squared, d squared u, dx squared, and we have dx dr. And then we multiply by another dx dr. It's kind of just, and, and I, I see what you're saying. And so, you know, it, it kind of makes sense to have it be d squared x dr squared. Uh, but because we're making this conversion through the chain rule, we kind of apply the chain rule kind of one, one derivative at a time. And so that's why we get dx dr twice. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions on, on this? Okay, so let's go ahead and plug these back in. And so if we plug these back in, we get uh, the following equation. Okay. Okay. And so we plug these back into our equation, what we get is x squared. Well, I guess we had to we had to convert the the other side of the equation too, but you know that one's pretty easy to do. And so we have an x squared a. I don't know why I drew the a so small. A divided by i rho omega is equal to x squared d squared u dx squared plus x du dx plus um, x squared u, okay. Let me rearrange this a little bit. And so we can see that this has an x squared, this has an x squared. I guess the, the first derivative also has an x squared, but you know we're gonna combine those two terms. And so if we combine these two, if we combine these two, what we get is x squared, d squared u, dx squared, plus x du dx, plus parentheses, we have u minus a over i rho omega, times x squared, okay? 
And all this is equal to zero because we, we move that over to the other side. All right, we're super, we're super close. And so we're super close to the, uh, to the Bessels form now, okay? The only kind of blemish that we have to deal with now is just this, is just this one right here, okay? If we can get rid of that, then you know, we're, we're exactly at our Bessels form uh, and we can solve it with the Bessels, with the Bessels solution, okay? And so just, just like we did uh, just, just now, we're gonna make another change of variables to get rid of that, that term, okay? But this, this one's a lot easier because you know, this term that we're trying to get rid of, uh, this is just a constant, okay? Okay, but instead of making a change of variables from x, and so the x is already good, so the x we're happy with, we're going to make a change of variables for u. Okay, and so what we're going to say is that we're going to make a define a new variable y. Okay, and this is going to be equal to u. It's going to be u minus a over i rho omega. So we're, we're substituting for u this time, um, but this is a lot. But this is not bad because you know this a over i rho omega, we know that this is a constant, right? And so when we take derivatives, so let's say that we have dy dx, okay? This is just going to be exactly du dx, right? And then if we take d squared y, dx squared. This is exactly d squared u dx squared, okay? And so if we make that change to y, then we're gonna end up with a homogeneous differential equation, which is, which is great, okay? And so finally, you know, once we make that last step, we arrive at our Bessel equation. And so we make that change, we get x squared, d squared y, dx squared, plus x dy dx, plus x squared y. Okay. And just like we've been saying today, this, this equation right here is a very special one. And so someone solved this equation long ago. And so this is our Bessel's equation. Okay. And the solution to Bessel's equation is Bessel's functions. And so our solution, y of x is equal to c1 j sub zero as a function of x plus c2 y sub zero as a function of x, okay? Where j zero and y zero are the Bessel functions, okay? And so what's the difference between J0 and Y0? Well, 
you know, Bessel was a very, uh, you know, he was a very caring guy. And so he, he viewed these functions as his kids, right? And so he gave them very good names. And so J0, J0 is the Bessel function. J0 is Bessel function one. And Y0 is Bessel function two. That's literally their names. I'm not even joking. I hope you didn't I hope you didn't have more than one kid. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's you know we we kind of laugh about it, but you know, but they what's special about these Bessel functions is that they're kind of special oscillatory functions. So they they I think what's more what's more beneficial is to kind of look what they uh, kind of see what they look like. And so let's look at J zero first. Okay. And so J0 of X looks like the following. And so it starts out high up here, but then it oscillates kind of like a cosine. And so it starts out high and then it kind of, you know, oscillates, but it oscillates, you know, a little bit down there, okay? And so it, it, you can think of it as a sinusoid, but a sinusoid that starts high and kind of comes down after that, okay? Y0, on the other hand, looks like the following. And so Y0 actually has, it actually has a singularity at uh, X equal to zero. And so it starts out from negative infinity, comes up, okay? And then it oscillates around zero, okay? Okay. And so they're, they're basically, um, you know, you can almost think of them as like empirical functions. So they don't they don't have a functional form, um, but they do have well known values. And so actually, MATLAB actually has the Bessel function built into it. And so if you're curious to see what the Bessel functions look like, there's a special MATLAB function that that can show you. Okay. Okay, and so we've done all this work. We've done all these change of variables, and what we've seen is that if we have an unsteady, an unsteady solution, uh, or unsteady uh, forcing, then our velocity follows this Bessel solution. Okay. okay, but what you can see here is that you know we have our two Bessel functions, but we also have C one and C two. Okay, and so the next step that we're going to do is we're going to apply boundary conditions. We're going to apply boundary conditions to solve for C1 and C2. All right, so we're, we're basically treating this, you know, we, we, we took, you know, quite a few kind of extracurricular steps to get here, you know, but essentially this is the, this is the solution to a ordinary differential equation. Uh, and so we're going to treat it as such. And so, you know, once we get it to this point where, you know, we can consider this to be our general solution, we then apply boundary conditions to get our specific, our specific solution. All right. Any questions on uh, any questions on how we got here? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and apply boundary conditions. And so um, you know, it's 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 a little bit hard to envision this because you know we we've made so many change of variables. But remember, x and r are essentially the same. X and R are the same, and remember, R R measures the R measures the radial coordinate inside inside our vessel, right? And so here's our vessel, right? If we start at the middle, 
Okay, so the middle of the vessel we say is r is equal to zero. Okay, and eventually we our domain is to go from r is equal to zero to r is equal to r. Okay. And so the boundary conditions that we apply, I mean, normally we apply them at uh, at values of r. Uh, but for this case, you know, since we're in x, you know, we're going to be applying the boundary conditions of x. But you know, they're essentially the same thing. Okay. All right. So the first one that we're going to do is we're going to apply a boundary condition at the middle of the vessel. Okay. And so the middle of the vessel is going to be at r is equal to zero. But by the way that we define x, right, r is equal to zero also corresponds to x is equal to zero as well, right? Okay. And so what's our condition at, at x is equal to zero? Well, you know, we, uh, if you kind of recall from, you know, way back when, when we, when we solved this formula with uh, under the steady case, our condition at the center of the vessel is that we have to have a finite solution at the center of the vessel, okay? And so what does physical mean? Well, it has to be not infinity, okay? Let's look back at our graphs for a vessel function one, vessel function two, right? What do we notice when X is equal to zero um, for both of these functions, right? So J zero is okay, right? So for X, when we have X equals zero, you know, J zero, it has an elevated value, um, you know, but otherwise it's, it's, it's fine, okay? When we plug in zero to, to uh, Y, Right, this, this graph basically tells us that when y, uh, when x equals to zero, vessel function two essentially equals to minus infinity, okay? Right. And of course, you know, we can't have minus infinity lost, right? And so in order for us to get a physical solution, this tells us immediately that C2 has to be zero. Or in other words, you know, y zero cannot be part of the solution. And so we just kind of eliminate it. You know, we uh, we kick them off the island. You know, immediately. Okay. All right. And so now our solution, u of x, simply consists of vessel function one. Okay. Right. So this is so this is the uh, equation that we're that we're left with. Okay. Now we're going to apply the other boundary condition. And the other boundary condition, you know, even though it's simple, it's simple to um, uh, simple to explain. It's going to be a little bit difficult to implement because of all the change of variables that we did. Okay. Okay. And of course, that condition is going to be when uh, the radius uh, or when the r is equal to the radius of the vessel. Okay. And so, when little r is equal to big R, what we have is our no slip boundary condition. And so in other words, what we have is u at r is equal to big R is equal to zero, okay? Okay. And so intuitively, you know, this, this, this makes sense, right? Um, but our solution right now, well, I'm sorry, it's not u of x, it should be y of x, okay? And so our solution right now is not in terms of u, but it's in terms of y, okay? And so the next step is gonna to be to translate this, this condition on u onto a condition on y, okay? Okay. 
And what we also need to do is we need to translate the R value. We need to translate to that to a value of X as well. Okay, so we're going to kind of you know undo undo all of our all of our change of variables. Okay, so let's start with y because that's actually the the easy one, right? So we know that y, the change of variables that we did was that we said that y is equal to u minus a divided by i rho omega. Okay, and so this was the change of variables that we did to transform to y. Sorry, what's I knew Um I knew Omega, yes, thank you. Oh no, it's it's I it's I row omega. Yeah, it's it should be I row omega. That was for that was for what? Yeah. Okay. And so this condition, and so this condition on u says that u is equal to zero, right? And so we say that this is going to equal to zero, okay? And so the equivalent condition for y is to say that y is equal to minus a over i omega rho, okay? And so the the condition of u of is equal to zero is the same thing as y is equal to minus i um, omega rho, okay? Okay, so now let's do x, okay? And so x we know is i three halves r square root of rho or divided by nu, okay? okay? And so when we plug in uh, big R, what we get is i to three halves big R omega over nu. Okay. And so our condition then is gonna be Y as at X is equal to I three halves big R square root of omega over nu, okay? It's gonna be equal to minus A over I omega rho, okay? And so we plug that in to our equation here this is C1, J0, and we plug in for X, okay? We know that X is equal to I to three halves, big R, the root of mega over nu, okay? And so this is the boundary condition that we're going to apply here. Okay, so we're just about out of time, so let me go ahead and, and just, just kind of finish this up. And so everything here is known. And so we can go ahead and solve for C1. Okay. And so we get that C1 is equal to uh, minus AI divided by rho omega times J0 I to three halves R square root of omega over Ah, yeah, so how does the I move to the numerator? And so we, we basically multiply the top and bottom by I. And so if we do that, then we have a um, I squared on the bottom and I have an extra negative here. Thank you. And so if we multiply by I um, to the top and bottom, then we get I squared on the bottom, which is minus one. And we end up with an I on, we end up with an I on top. And so the minus one is gonna cancel out with this negative and we end up with a positive AI over rho negative. Okay, and so another heavy math day, I know, um, you know, but uh, the days of heavy math are gonna end soon, I, I promise. <laughs> All right, any final questions before we, uh, we wrap it up for today?
Ah, and so you know, it's it's just based on what the two functions look like. So J zero and and Y zero are special Bessel functions, and so this is just kind of how they're defined and how they look like. And so since Y zero is defined to be minus infinity at X is equal to zero, then we know that that can't be part of our solution because we can't we can't have minus infinity part uh, at our at at our at X is equal to zero. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, so that's it uh, for today. Um, and so remember, you know, if, if you're uh, still working on the project and you need a little bit of help, you know, please shoot me an email. Uh, I won't be on campus tomorrow, you know, but I'll try to be on Zoom as much as I can. And so if we, if you want to set up a, a, you know, a private appointment tomorrow, uh, I'm happy to do so. And so, you know, I think for a lot of for a lot of the image data, you know, I think it's it's a little bit difficult to get started. So, you know, please reach out if you're having trouble finding out where to where to start. All right, so thank you everyone for tuning in today. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your afternoon and I will see you on Thursday. Yep. Okay, here you go. It's going. Um, like Poland. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out right here why it's doing that. Yeah. Is it because I put it to another It's doing that. It looks like you have. Uh, uh, yeah. I thought you didn't have. I thought it was longer. You, you, might, you probably need a segmentation there that goes kind of perpendicular. Like, so I don't know if your path can, can accommodate that, but if the path can go into that. We just we just need a second piece of it. Just so. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. And so and so it's basically so you have a segmentation here and one right here. So so I, need, I need one right here. I need one right here. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so yeah. much. Hey. What's gonna be my like, video from the like from yesterday? Because I couldn't find it like. Uh, yeah, I, I posted it. I posted it late. Let me go for a second piece. Oh, for this class, or for last Thursday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for yeah, yeah. I, I posted it. I posted it right before the lecture. Right before the lecture today, I I uploaded it uh, late last night before I went home, and I just forgot to post it. Yeah. But I did that right before, so it should be up. Yeah, I I was looking like before the class, and I find it with the with the link for the video. Oh, and was uh, it the wrong link? No, I just found it like on the link. Okay, okay. From the link because like I didn't see it from the section like week twelve. There's like the you know how you have like notes and the uh -huh. and I didn't see the link. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I just I just I had to canvas uh just like five minutes before. Uh, all right. That was a question. Yeah. One more question. Can yeah. we get a cheat sheet on the picture? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So same same standards I always use. Just uh, all one side. Uh, both sides. So okay. eight and a half by eleven sheet both sides. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure. Go back. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that uh, the main one. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah, it's that, that's that's okay. So that's that's probably a result of your segmentation. You, know, mm -hmm. you might you might try to you, know, you can try to smooth your segmentation. Okay. Bit. That'll make it a bit smoother. Okay. Uh, but there's some there's some extra models in the that we don't have yet, and most people will kind of need that. Okay. And so we'll go over that in our second workshop. Okay. So uh, would you recommend me to like try to smooth it out or wait till I got? Yeah. So it, any smoothing you can do now with all that because there's going to be some additional rough spots, especially when you have branching vessels. Right. At the point where they intersect, that yeah. that could be kind of rough. Sometimes. Okay. I found myself doing. I think I overdid it because I was doing for like the points. Yeah. I did like every five. Uh -huh. And that, that's a lot. Oh, it should be okay. Okay. I mean, this is I did, I did so many when I was in segmentations. So I had to erase a lot of them that would do this. Oh, and this. I see. So, so like I so at the one. end, the 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 smooth the, the, the threshold yeah. ended up erasing like half of them, which would have set uh I guess save time if I just did point ten instead of point five. Yeah, yeah. So the so the, yeah, your path is not very smooth. So there's there's path smoothing stuff. Too. Okay. So we can go over it. Okay. But if you look at the path for the path, okay. there should be a button. I think it's on the right side that says smooth. So you might want to type in that. Okay. And you can try doing your segmentation again. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks.
All right, Jimena, any, any final questions before I, I close the Zoom call? Okay, all right, I'm going to close it up. All right, see you Thursday.